All right, so in order to get the waste materials out of the bloodstream and eventually into the urine, you have three processes. Um, glomerular filtration occurs here, and then as this filtrate, as this fluid moves through the rest of the nephron, you have tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Remember that reabsorption is going from the tubule back eventually into the bloodstream. Secretion is going the other way, from the bloodstream into the tubule. Now, glomerular filtration only occurs in the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is here, the corpuscle is made up of the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. Reabsorption uh, occurs mainly in the proximal convoluted tubule. A little bit in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, and then of course the loop of Henle, water is reabsorbed on this side. Sodium and chloride ions are reabsorbed on this side. You're going to get filtration here, mainly reabsorption here, mainly secretion here. These guys, the loop of Henle and the collecting ducts, make that final, are involved in that final chemical adjustments particularly the distal end of the convoluted tubule and the collecting duct uh, to make sure that you don't pee yourself to death. Make sure that you produce a small volume <laughs> of concentrated urine. So this is the first step, glomerular filtration. This, the filtration membrane right here basically is composed of the capillary. The capillary is a fenestrated capillary. So these endothelial cells have the little holes, the little fenestrations. Then you've got what's called the lamina densa, which is this blue layer here. That's like the basal lamina. They just call it the lamina densa in this particular area. It's just a layer, a thin layer of uh, protein, basically. It's almost like a glue. And then you have the filtration slits, which are between the pedicels of the photocells. The filtration slits are between the pedicels, the little finger-like things, of the photocytes, the cells that form that visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. Um, this is the photocyte, so that's the, the layer of the Bowman's capsule that surrounds all the capillaries. It is a layer. It is a layer. That's the visceral layer. This is the parietal layer. And then you have the capsular space where the filtrate initially goes once it's been removed from the bloodstream. If you just had the capillary itself, if you didn't have the uh, lamina densa and the filtration slits, what would happen is you could keep blood cells. Blood cells are too big to get through the fenestrations, but some plasma proteins could get through there. But this definitely keeps the blood cells from getting out of the capillary into the tubule, into the urine. And so the lamina densa is basically like having a real thick mesh. Those collagen fibers make a real thick network or thick mesh. And so that permits most of the proteins, or excuse me, prevents most of the proteins from getting out. Most of the proteins stay in here. But you still get water ions, nutrients like amino acids, um, glucose molecules, those types of things can pass through the lamina densa. Obviously they can pass through the fenestrations because they're small. They can also pass through the lamina densa. And then finally, those tiny gaps, the little spaces between the pedicels and the protocytes, <coughs> keeps most of the small proteins from getting through. And so it's like having three different layers, three different filter sizes, one with big holes, one with smaller holes, and one with even smaller holes. There, are, there is a type of albumin. Remember, albumin is the most predominant serum or plasma protein. Some people, and it just depends on their genetics, some people make something, make a something called a microalbumin. It's a really, really small albumin molecule. And they can get a little bit of that into their urine. And so if you test their urine for protein, you get a trace, and that's that's fine. That's okay. And so if you look at this, this would be like, this would be the blood be here. This would be the fenestration. That'd be that dense protein layer. And then that'd be that little filtration slit. That'd be a pedicel. And so the fluid, the filtrate, has to go through all of that all right, so that fluid that is initially filtered out of the blood, out of the glomerular capillaries, is called the filtrate. Ladies, we produce about 150 liters per day. Guys, a little bit more, 180 liters per day. Now, two liter drink, 150 divided by two is 75 two liter drinks. Picture that in your mind. How much blood do we have? 
five to six liters. So you could feed yourself to death pretty quickly if you didn't reabsorb most of that fluid. Now, that filtrate, what's present in the filtrate? Well, lots of water, metabolic waste, which is the whole purpose of sending the blood to the kidney. But you also have ions, sodium ions, potassium ions, bicarbonate ions, hydrogen ions, calcium ions, all kinds of ions. Glucose, some fatty acids, some amino acids, even some vitamins. These things are small enough to cross all three layers. Normally, you don't have blood cells, and you don't have maybe just a little trace of protein. Most of your protein is going to stay in here. So if they test your urine, and they find blood, and they find a lot of protein in your urine, they know something is wrong with your filtration membrane. It could be an infection. It could be high blood pressure that's basically blown it out. All right, so what are these metabolic waste? So what you're trying to get out of the blood is urea. If you remember, I don't know, what did we talk about? We were talking about protein back last semester. Proteins are made out of amino acids. And so if you eat a diet high in proteins, uh, some of the proteins, the amino group, is removed from the amino acids. Remember that? Uh, Generic amino acid looks something like this. And then some R group that varies depending on what the amino acid is. And so these things get removed, and then they go to the liver, and the liver hooks up two of these and a carbon dioxide and makes your read. This by itself can get converted to ammonia and converted to the ammonium ion. And these things are toxic to your cells. And so any of this, any of these amino groups that are removed are sent to the liver. The liver makes urea out. Urea is not very toxic. It's very water soluble, very easy to excrete in the urine. You also excrete a little bit in the sweat. Creatinine is a second metabolic waste. Where do you get creatinine? Remember that you have in your skeletal muscles and your cardiac muscle too, creatine. And you take a phosphate and you make creatine phosphate, that's one way that the skeletal muscles store energy. If you're doing a lot of exercise, you're breaking down a little bit of that protein. And creatine gets converted to creatinine. Is that bad? No. But it's a waste material that your body needs to get rid of. And then uric acid is produced from the recycling of an RNA, from recycling of RNA. Um, the DNA has the gene. The DNA is transcribed to make RNA. The RNA is translated to make a protein. Well, you recycle that RNA. Once you've made all of that protein you need, you recycle it. And so uric acid is produced from that. So these are normal metabolic waste materials that your cells are producing all the time. So you need to get rid of them. That's what you clear out of the blood. You have to have a certain amount of pressure, a certain amount of fluid pressure to force filtrate to be produced. And so basically the hydrostatic pressure, basically the blood pressure inside the glomerulus forces fluid through those capillaries, through all of the, through the fenestrations and the lamina densa and the filtration slits. Forces it through that filtration membrane into the capsular space. But you also have pressures that oppose this. The capsular hydrostatic pressure, think about it this way. If there was a blockage right here, and then the fluid pressure would build up as the filtrate collected, then that would tend to force the fluid back <coughs> Does that make sense? So you have that capsular hydrostatic pressure, or fluid pressure, as well as, again, our good old blood colloid osmotic pressure. Remember that most of the proteins stay in here. And we talked about the fact that proteins tend to suck the fluid back in. So what's going on here is basically the same thing that was going on in this little diagram. The only difference is you have an afferent arterial here. And instead of having a venule over here, you have the efferent arterial. But it's the same kind of thing. You've got um, hydrostatic pressure forcing fluid out osmotic pressure pulling it back. Because just like this is a capillary, that's what these are. They're capillaries. So it's that Why same is it pulling back in? Any fluid. Just like in when we talked about capillary exchange, uh, seems like a year ago now. 
Initially, we're talking about capillaries all over the body. We're talking about the cardiovascular system. This was an arterial. This is a venule. And we said that blood pressure on this end of the capillary, blood pressure, was greater than osmotic pressure. Jeez. Hi. Blood pressure, greater than osmotic pressure. And so filtration occurred. But here, as the blood pressure dropped, the further you got away from the heart, then at this end, blood pressure uh, was less than osmotic pressure, and osmotic, the osmosis, the fluid was sucked back in because of the proteins inside, that stayed inside the blood vessel. So that's exactly the same thing that's going on here. You've got blood pressure, glomerular hydrostatic pressure, forcing fluid out. You've got blood colloid osmotic pressure sucking the fluid back in. And then, in addition, in this situation, you also have, as the fluid collects here, you've got the capsular hydrostatic pressure. And so if this fluid doesn't continue to move on down <coughs> the fuel, then you can get that built up, and that tends to oppose the fluid coming out. So the point is, you need enough of this, just a little bit more of this than these two things, so that you constantly get the blood flow. One of the things we talked about was the fact that the Afferent arterial was bigger than the efferent arterial. And so what that does is increases the pressure in these capillaries to about 50 millimeters of mercury. And then the fluid that's already in there is at about 15 millimeters of mercury. And so if you take 50 minus 15, that gives you about 35 millimeters of mercury, what we call the net hydrostatic pressure, just fluid pressure. Not involving osmotic pressure yet, but just the fluid pressure. The pressure of the fluid in here is about 50. The pressure of the fluid normally in here is about 15. And so that gives you a net hydrostatic pressure, a net fluid pressure of 35. And then you throw the, cos the osmotic pressure, the colloid osmotic pressure. Remember, colloid just refers to the proteins. The colloid osmotic pressure, that's about 25. And so you take 35 minus the 25, and you get a net filtration pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. So you don't need a whole lot of pressure, but you do need a little, you need just enough to overcome the um, osmotic pressure sucking it back in and the fluid pressure building up in the vessel. The afferent arterial is bringing blood in, the efferent is bringing blood out. Think about your front door being bigger than your back door. If you had a whole bunch of people running into your house through the front door and the back door was smaller, then the people would start to build up in your house, right? And that's what happens to the blood, so the pressure increases. And in fact, each little glomerulus controls its glomerular hydrostatic pressure by altering the diameter of the arterial, of the, excuse me, apparent and efferent arterials. So that they maintain that pressure difference to force fluid out of the bloodstream into the, into the capsular space. So regardless of changes in the systemic blood pressure, each little glomerulus controls its own individual blood pressure as long as the systemic doesn't get too far out of whack. Right. So, when they, one of the tests they can do for kidney function is to measure somebody's glomerular filtration rate. So every minute, males produce about 125 mils of filtrate. And not urine, just filtrate. Okay, just the fluid that enters the capsule here. Okay. Ladies, a little bit less. So how much filtrate is is produced it depends on how much blood's going to the kidneys. And that's why we say during shock, when your blood pressure drops, your kidneys aren't getting perfused. They basically stop working. And then, of course, maintaining the normal amount of pressure right here at each glomerulus. So basically, it's controlled systemically by blood going to the kidneys. And then locally, each glomerulus controls its own little blood pressure. All right, so each glomerulus regulates its own little glomerular pressure independently of everything else. And it does that by basically controlling the afferent and efferent arterioles. Remember, the arteriole is basically the endothelium and some smooth muscle cells. It doesn't have that tunica external, so it can, arterioles can um, dilate and constrict as needed. So if your blood pressure slash blood flow to the kidneys decrease, then the afferent arterial gets bigger, the efferent arterial gets smaller, and that increases the blood pressure. 
so that filth, so that fluid is forced out of the bloodstream into the capsule. If the blood pressure gets too high, the afferent arterial constricts because you don't want the blood pressure in here to get too high or you'll blow out the capillaries. So basically these guys, these afferent and efferent arterials control local blood pressure, blood pressure in each glomerulus, so that you end up with about 10 millimeters of mercury of blood pressure. So red is released from the ducts glomerular blood. If the uh, glomerular blood pressure decreases, because what happens is the glomerular filtration rate decreases. In other words, if the blood pressure drops inside these capillaries, you're going to get less fluid form, less filtering. All right, so that is a signal for REN to be released. Another signal for REN to be released is that the, the concentration of the tubular fluid here, the fluid that's actually passed through the proximal convoluted tubule down and up the loop of Henle into the distal convoluted tubule, because that's basically what this is over here, right? If the fluid concentration is decreased, what does that mean? It's watery, yeah, exactly. It's watery. And then if the sympathetic autonomic nervous cells stimulate this area, you're going to get this. Well, when does your sympathetic autonomic nervous system kick in? If your blood pressure drops, it's going to kick in to try to raise it back up. So at the same time all of this is going on, remember, you're also getting increased heart rate. Um, your peripheral arterioles are going to constrict. So more blood is shunted to the internal organs. More blood is going to be shed into the kidneys. And then, of course, once you get renin, you get the angiotensin 2. Renin eventually results in the production of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 does four things. First of all, it makes you thirsty. Oh, look, look, look. What else does it do? Vasoconstriction. Increases resistance, increases blood pressure. And then it results in the, in the production of two, or the release of two hormones. Well, let's start with that. Aldosterone. There you go, ADH. Antidiuretic hormone tells your kidneys to do what? Not pee. Not pee. Reabsorb water. Aldosterone tells your kidneys to reabsorb So here's where you're, we, we, we didn't talk about this because we hadn't talked about what an efferent arterial was yet, but it also says constrict the efferent arterial. Back the blood up, increase that pressure inside the glomerulus. So if blood pressure drops, we get this whole cascade. If blood pressure gets too high, your good old natriuretic peptides. Remember, natri natriuretic makes you pee sodium, right? Get it. And so, Natriuretic peptides, the atrial natriuretic peptides, whew, that's hard to say, and the brain natriuretic peptides. They basically do the opposite of all of this. They say, vasodilate, don't, get, don't drink any water, pee out the sodium, pee out the water, because blood pressure is too high. So, on the kidneys, what happens? It increases the movement of sodium and water into the tubules. That's not reabsorbed, they stay in the tubules. So you pee that out. The afferent um, is dilated, the efferent is constricted, so you get more glomerular filtration rate, more urine produced. It's a greater volume of urine with more stuff in it. What happens is if blood pressure is high, you're trying to get rid of the fluid, right? The, the easiest way to get rid of the fluid is to make more pee. So to make more pee, you've got to have more filtrate. Right? And to get more filtrate, you got to have more blood coming in than you do coming out. And so you make the afferent bigger and the efferent smaller, the pressure in here increases, more filtrate is produced. And of course, we know about the sympathetic nervous system.